Did you know that the average English-speaking adult with a PhD has no more than 35,000 words that they use? Do you know that the average adult without a PhD can detect a trillion different scents? Let that number sink in. A human being can detect more than one trillion different smells. The sound you are hearing is the first sound ever recorded. And the video you're watching is the first video ever recorded in the 1800s. That audiovisual industry that has audio and sound today is worth more than two trillion dollars. Two trillion dollars. Our species, we interact with the world through our senses. Our sight, our ears, and our nose. Based on what I have told you. So, if our sense of smell is so powerful, why have we not digitized it? Right here in this room, thousands of chemicals are affecting your mood, affecting how you feel. But till date, no one can map the smells. The question is why? A human being is capable of detecting about 7.5 million colors. To reach 7.5 million colors, you need only three base cells. Red, green, and blue, that's it. These are the cells in your eyes that allow you to see color in different gradations. However, in your nose, you have 400 different receptors. These 400 different receptors combine in a myriad of ways that you can smell the hair of your child or you can smell a glass of wine. Interestingly, of all the senses that you have, it is only your sense of smell that has a direct connection to your amygdala. This is the part you got from essentially the lizards. Can you refer your mind back to when you have this smell and you feel it so viscerally? The reason why is because your sense of smell is connected directly to your mind. It's a highway. The reason why we haven't been able to digitize smell is because it's a very hard problem. It's a very hard problem that biology has solved over 600 million years. So here we do a little bit of science. How does it work? This room is full of particles, particles of smell. Each one of these particles, they go into your nose. When it gets inside your nose, it comes across a GPCR receptor. This receptor is on the surface of what you call an olfactory sensory neuron. When this particle binds to the neuron, it generates an action potential. This action potential travels all the way to your brain. And in your brain, you get the sensation of I'm smelling lemon or I'm smelling wine. Just like I have sensation that I must drink water. Now, because of all the different chemical compounds we have in the air, and our ability not to see them, or our inability not to see them, what are the opportunities that exist 
when we are able to make the invisible visible. For example, some of you that came outside of Germany here, or even inside Germany, you have to go through an airport. And when you're at the airport, you're face down and you have to pass your thing through the x-ray machine. Some of you are lucky enough to get randomly selected and checked. The, the reason why they're doing this is basically because they're searching for explosives. You will notice that there is a technology that is always in use at these airports. This technology is essentially a dog. So they bring a dog along and the dog sniffs you. The dog has no magical powers. What the dog is essentially doing is collecting particles, analyzing it, and these particles go to its brain. Based on the training, it comes and it lays down beside you and gets a treat. And it has smelled an explosive. Remember that, we'll come to it later. Today, across the world, have a look at healthcare. This is a projection of what the healthcare will look like by the year 2040. In China alone, the cost of healthcare would increase by 700%. In Bangladesh, by 200%. In the UK today, the NHS is creaking under the weight of being able to treat people and healthcare costs. Because we have been able to grow the population, but the method of deploying and treating people still remains stuck in the 20th century. Do you know that when you fall sick, your smell changes? In fact, there are some dogs that are trained to detect cancer. The reason why those dogs are able to detect cancer again is because of what I explained earlier. For some of these diseases, liver cirrhosis, for instance, you need just 11 volatile organic compounds to be able to figure out if a person has liver cirrhosis. Some of you that know diabetic people will know that when they have the diabetes attack, they have a different smell to them. My company aims to build a system that merges synthetic neurobiology with silicon to build what we call living machines. So how does this work? Remember the sensors I told you about earlier in the nose of the dog? We take living cells, we genetically modify them using DNA and get these living cells to express the exact same receptor you have in the nose of the dog. So what happens on our chip is, you have particles in the air, we have a semi-permeable membrane that allows these particles to come into the fluid where we have the cells, and we're able to record the electrical signals from the cell. So what you see here on your screen is essentially a biological neuron. We have on the, on the top left-hand corner, an electrode that has been genetically, uh, that has been covered with a gene sequence that essentially tricks the brain cell into thinking a metal electrode is essentially another brain cell. And on the bottom left-hand corner, you see a brain cell that essentially has little microphones sticking into the brain cells so that every time the brain cell comes across a particle, and it generates an electrical signal we can record from it. Remember quickly how the system works. In the nose of the dog, yes, you have a cell that collects particles from the air. It goes into the nose of the dog, it generates an elect electrical signal, it goes to the brain of the dog. What we do is cut it off at the stage where the signal goes to the brain of the dog. But when you cut that signal off, you have to be able to transfer it to a computer. And what you see on the lower left-hand corner is the exact signal that goes to the brain of the dog. And now we have digitized it. We go a little bit farther. Because the dog takes forever to do any detection, we even genetically modify the pathway to respond faster. So what you see on the left-hand side is the natural pathway. 
TATP, which is an explosive, the explosive that was used in Paris, that was used in Brussels, for instance, when we expose it to, our, to the brain cells, so the natural one is the one on the left, and the one that we have engineered is on the right. And you will notice that when you expose TATP to it, the cells respond. And the natural pathway responds a little bit slower. So we have been able to confer on these cells the ability to smell. And of course, it won't be complete if we didn't show the data. So what you see on the top left-hand corner is the fact that we are able to detect these explosive compounds in parts <coughs> per billion in the non-contact mode. I know, this all sounds like science fiction. But this is what the device actually looks like. So in there, you see a little vial that has the TATP explosive inside. And in there, you have the brain cells that respond to the signals. And we have an FPGA chip that allows us to record those signals. We started this in February of 2016. When we started, the size of the device was about the size of a small microwave oven. Now we've been able to reduce the size of the device to that of an iPhone. So I'm going to quickly show you what the device looks like in operation and the fact that we're beginning manufacturing now. Uh, here with you, the other soldering uh, techniques. That's Reno, our you chief engineer. Have to do it at some point in your life. So those are the microfluidics chip that go inside the device. And of course, for prototyping, we use 3D printing. And that's the FPGA chip that drives it. As of today, we can put together 40 devices in a month. By the end of next year, we want to be able to put together 10,000 devices. And this is the device in operation with TATP. That is a detection event. Yay! <laughs> and of course, we have a fair bit of them. This is what the final device looks like that the device goes into. So, essentially, what is the anatomy of the device looking like? Like I said, it's a living machine. It's a machine that combines electronics with living tissue. That means it has to be able to live. That means it has to be able to breathe. The device has what we call neuron fluid inside. Essentially, it's a media that has vitamins. It has water, it has sugar in it, and it's a consumable. And on the same chip, you have a waste. Uh, on the same uh, device, you have a waste, a waste box that you change after every two months. Our goal is to have a device that lasts up to two years. This is what the conical core looks like, or the conical core. We have taken inspiration from biology to design this device. The device looks like a jellyfish for the simple reason that jellyfishes were the first creatures to have essentially brains, brains in them, or at least a neural network. So, how do we apply such a technology, or what does it open up? So currently, we are looking to deliver these devices to airports for airport security. As of today, we work with some of the biggest names in airport security, and our goal is that this thing comes to an airport near you within the next one year or thereabout. What really excites me about what we do is the ability to build companion devices. Imagine a world where you have a conicor in every home. You can continually monitor your health just by breathing on a device. Don't get me wrong, this is going to take a while. You have to go through the FDA, you have to denoise the data that exists in the literature. But one thing I do feel confident about is that as a company, we have been able to solve the smell problem. So where are we going with this technology? Currently, we have a device where we can grow two million neurons. What happens when we are able to grow 10 billion neurons, for instance? 
There's a lot of talk these days about what the future of intelligence looks like. I and my team, we believe intelligence would eventually be a merger of synthetic neurobiology and silicon. The reason why we believe that is because we already have functioning examples in front of us. And this is our mantra, biology is technology. But to convince you a little bit further, if you consider that a transistor is about equivalent to a synapse, and you do the quick back of the envelope math, you will find that to simulate one centimeter cube of gray matter, you will need to build a chip that is the size of a basketball court. This is one of the things that they are finding out at the Human Brain, uh, the Human Brain Project in Lausanne right now. The brain has incredible computational density. So that means with such a small area, it's able to do so much. What would happen when we're able to deploy this technology to do computation? We have already started working on this. So on the top left-hand corner, what you see is us designing circuits that don't exist in nature. So on the bottom left-hand corner, you see three conic cores. So this is essentially brain reaggregates that we connect together in a way that we can teach them to do things. So here, you see several videos running in parallel. On the top left-hand corner, you see several cores where we connect many different brain cells together or many artificial brain regions together. In the middle, what we have done is we have scanned the brain of a mouse and we've collected the blood vessels. We've collected the way the blood vessels are engineered. And we've essentially transferred the same engineering or the same blood vessel pattern to what you see on the bottom left-hand corner. We have been able to build the architecture or an artificial architecture of brains. Now, can we teach them something? There's a concept in neuroscience that is called neurons that fire together, they wire together. So for instance, when you see food, you salivate. Within a time window, it's because you've learned to associate food with salivation. You've been able to associate food with satiation. So we do the same thing on our chip, essentially. So the experiment we've done here on our simple device is to essentially train our chips for 60 seconds. And what we find is actually that we can modify the weights between these individual neurons. Don't get me wrong, this is clinical R&D here. This is something that is still preliminary. But on the chip, we have been able to show that we can do learning just with about two million neurons. Of course, the learning doesn't last so long. The goal then is to begin to add emotion to it. And these emotions are nothing more than chemical signals that you can put on the chip to make the learning last longer. Thank you very much.